Welcome to Bite Size. In today's episode, we're having a brief look at the plug and play architecture. In the beginnings of data processing technology, the hardware was just a collection of modules, and the functions of those modules had to be linked to accommodate different calculating operations. This linking was usually done by connecting some wires between the modules and disconnecting others. As general purpose computing devices developed, these connections and disconnections were instead used to specify locations in the system address space, where an expansion device should appear in order for the device to be accessible by the central processing unit. As computers became more accessible to the general public, the need developed for more frequent changes to be made by computer users unskilled with soldering irons. Rather than cutting and soldering connections, configuration was accomplished by jumpers or dip switches. However, this was also problematic and the system might still seem to work properly with an incorrect setting, until the IRQ or DMA is actually needed and the entire system suddenly freezes and needs to be reset. In 1987, the microchannel architecture was introduced, and this allowed expansion devices to be set up with accompanying software. But it's not until we had legacy ISA plug and play at the start of the 1990s that things became more user friendly. Plug and play starts off with a plug and play compatible motherboard. This motherboard has a BIOS that understands plug and play, and also contains about 16K of non volatile storage, NVS. One easy way to implement this is by putting the NVS in among the BIOS code, which means using a flash BIOS, which is what we're familiar with nowadays. Pretty much anything since 1995 would have been plug and play. Lots of earlier systems claimed they were plug and play, but actually suffered from a bad case of 1.0-itis, a disease you've probably run across in the past. You must also have adding cards that are plug and play compatible. These cards are configured every time you boot, and that configuration is done by a routine called the Configuration Manager, or CM. The CM is usually part of the BIOS. It's possible to build a plug and play system that loads its CM off disk, but I don't recommend it as you end up with only a mildly plug and play system. In addition to a plug and play motherboard and expansion boards, you need a plug and play compatible operating system. The idea here is the system powers up and the CM assumes control. It asks each board which resources it needs and what range it can accept. For example, a board might say I need an IRQ and it will take either 2, 3, 4 or 5. In the same way that the Microsoft ISA bus mouse interface does. Even though there are other interrupts, its circuitry for some reason will only accept an IRQ in the range of 2 to 5. The CM then assigns resources to cards, avoiding conflicts. This means that potentially installing one new plug and play card to a plug and play system would cause all the other cards to move their resources around. A DOS based machine won't work properly unless you give it the settings in the startup files. In contrast, the plug and play system takes its cues from the CM automatically, removing the need for operator intervention. Once all the boards have been taken care of, then the system boots in the usual way. The main difference with plug and play is that the whole hardware shuffling of resources, IO addresses, DMA channels, RAM windows and the like happens every time you boot the system, and one hopes quickly and invisibly. You can also force a particular board to a particular resource, and that's called locking the resource. The CM on your system should allow that, or your operating system may. Windows 95 and 98 let you do it with Device Manager, which is in the control panel, and this pretty much continues to this day. 